Hello and welcome to This Day in Esoteric Political History from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. And now part two of our very wide-ranging conversation with Wright Thompson, author of The Barn, which is the epic story about the place where 14-year-old Emmett Till was murdered in 1955 and Wright's attempt to understand the centuries of history that led to that moment and the way that we reconcile history and memory today. Uh, If you heard part one, you get a sense of how ambitious his work is, but he also pulls it off. So in this episode, we start by talking a little bit about the work of writing history and how you can take big swings while also telling grounded, propulsive stories. Then we get back a little bit into Emmett Till and Mississippi and the place where Wright lives, Oxford, which is the home of Ole Miss. So anyway, let's get into it. It's time to get swept away. This starts with a question from me to Wright and Nikki and Kelly about history storytelling. Let me ask this of all of you, because you've all done the work of history and the work of writing. How do you marry those two? How do you try and sweep everything into a story while also making sure that you're staying on point, you're moving readers along, you're providing new information. I'm, I'm sure there's people listening and thinking, gosh, this could just spiral out to infinity. Uh, let it spiral mm-hmm. out to infinity. Yeah. Mm. The point isn't the ending. The point is the mm-hmm. journey. Yeah. The point is the quest. The point is interrogating your own memory. The point is knowing that eyewitness accounts and trials are a coin flip that people's memory is inherently flawed and people's memory is the most precious thing to them. Mm -hmm. So as opposed to trying to pretend like that isn't true, I think you just have to always look at the, you know, history is the metal rod and memory is Mm -hmm. the great big magnet. Mm -hmm. And, And you can't separate them. You just have to try to always make them be in conversation with each other is what I would say. But mm-hmm. I defer to the actual experts here because I'm I, I genuinely yeah. I'm glad I didn't Google Kelly or Nicole before I came to the show the first time. <laughs> I, I would have shut the fuck up. <laughs> you knew me and you were not intimidated at all. So I take the compliment. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's true. Absolutely true. I mean, because of who I studied, I studied black abolitionists in my first book and then the lived experiences of black people and we refuse. Like, I have always tried to give voice to those who have been silenced, to bring those on the margins to the center and to amplify those voices, to consider because so much about black testimony has been discarded as not usable or untrue. My premises are, but what if it is? So like, I assume that it is. I assume black people are telling the truth. So when I hear stories from my mother or my aunts about what happened to them, I start from that premise. Um, And it's not about like, did you verify that? Did you look for the records to find out if it really, did she really step on a rusty nail? You know, like that's kind of not the point. The point is that these larger stories tell us a lot about the world they lived in and how they had to navigate it. And And that's very messy and it's very complicated. And I think people have to be able to sit Mm -hmm. with that, you know, like I think our students can handle that. We can talk about Washington being a great military leader and a slaveholder at the same time. Mm -hmm. We can complicate these things. And being the person standing in the breach for Indian removal. They could not remove the Creek, the Choctaw, the Cherokee and the Chickasaw until George Washington died. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's all those things. Nikki? Yeah. First of all, one of the things I love about having you on the show is watching genius at work. I kind of want to just sit back and listen <laughs> yeah, it is. over your fan, girly. <laughs> the resonance with me is I'm at the start of a new project on political impunity. And when I first started working on it, I kept trying to hold it in because I was like, if I let my mind go in all the different directions that this story is calling me to go, I will never be able to write this book because it will be infinite. And the mm-hmm. moment that I was like, just see where it takes you. And it takes you into court martials in Vietnam, and it takes you to the Nuremberg trials, and it takes you to all of these fundamental compromises that are part of the United States from its beginning. I, at some point, a narrative has to pull that back together. And yeah. you've had to do that with your book too, right? It has to fit between the covers in a way. But if you don't yeah. let the expansion happen. If you don't fall into the mm-hmm. infinite, then the book that you end up writing is small. And that's what I'm yeah. working with yeah. right now. 
Yeah. I mean, Aldous Huxley is right. If the doors of perception are cleansed, everything appears as is infinite. Hmm. And that's real. You know, the first draft of this book was 287,000 words and it ranked at 107 because it had to be everything. Mm. And then I had to go back and I invented a set of rules. Mm. Mm. It had to pass through the eye of a needle or it had to go. Mm. And I cut two books out of it because I was in the exact same problem you were in. When I tried to use my human mind to construct an arc, I wasn't capable of a big enough box to hold Mm -hmm. my idea. So I wrote the whole motherfucker. (laughs) I know I'm going to have to write the whole thing. No, you know, you're, no, you, you have to write the whole four thing. books. <laughs> no, but really, like the art is in the mm-hmm. cut, yeah. not in the doing. Write your whole idea. If it's Robert Cairo, fine. <laughs> yes. But it was more important to me to do the th- to, to lay it out as I saw it with everything that was connected, mm-hmm. and then start going back through it and be like, ah, that's really a stretch. Mm-hmm. Well, that's yeah. really. And so, one of the things I did something funny yesterday for the first time, I went and read the Amazon reviews. Mm. <laughs> and I love it because okay. one of my favorite things about creativity is like Rick Rubin, the music producer, says the first thing art has to do is divide the audience. Mm-hmm. If everybody loves it, it sucks. Mm. The way the audience divides on this is the people who love it understand that the whole structure of the book is designed to present things that seem to be unrelated and then to relate them in such a way that by the end of the book, mm. you can't ever imagine how you didn't know all yeah. of these things once. Yeah. Other people are infuriated by it. Mm-hmm. That's the test. That's the shibboleth. Mm-hmm. I do think that in something like this, at least I'm not smart enough to sit down and come up with an outline that I could do this. Now, that I'm about to have a panic attack as I read and underline these books because I don't know how I'm going to order the notes, much less how I'm going to decide what mm. to write. That happens to mm-hmm. me all the time. I have panic attacks. All the, I'm not, I feel like, you know, what's that meme from Saved by the Bell? There's no time. There's never any time. <laughs> I'm <laughs> so excited. <laughs> <laughs> that is this, uh, that's like once a week. I'm Jesse from Saved by the Bell. <laughs> Hey, it's Jody. Uh, First off, I want to say thank you to everyone who has already donated to Radiotopia's fall fundraiser. And if you are listening and you haven't donated to the network before, you might wonder where exactly your dollars go. Well, the short answer is that it goes into making three episodes of this show every week. You hear the names of the folks who help make the program. Our researcher, Jacob, our producer, Brittany, Kaula, who does the transcripts, and of course, Nikki and Kelly and me. And I'm a big believer that people should be paid for doing that kind of work. Look, I want to be clear about something. No one is getting rich off of this show. But I've been proud of the fact that over the years, even as the media landscape has gotten rockier and rockier, and we have ridden that roller coaster of ad dollars going up and down, we have still found a way to do it. And I'll be honest, there are months where it's really, really tight. There are some months where I don't come out in the black, but I still value making this show and supporting the people who help make this show. And I think it is important to keep plugging away paying people for their fair share and their hard work. And I can't say this enough. Listener support is a huge part of the puzzle that I just described of how we make it work. We literally, figuratively, metaphorically, pick your Ali, we could not do it without you, really. So if you can, take a moment and become a member of Radiotopia. You can do it right now at radiotopia.fm slash donate. It's tax deductible. And yes, there is a sweetener. When you do, you'll receive a special curated playlist from Radiotopia that we put together just for you. It's very cool. Go check it out. Again, radiotopia.fm slash donate. And thank you. All right, let's get on with the show. The 2024 election is upon us, and the stakes couldn't be higher. But the outcome might not be clear till long after everyone has voted. If the race ends up being as close as it looks right now, we could be in for a repeat, or worse, of the year 2000, when the presidency came down to a recount in Florida that ended at the Supreme Court. To hear the whole story, check out Fiasco, Bush v. Gore, a podcast from the co-creators of Slow Burn. Listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. 
right. I want to ask you one question, then we'll let you go and let people start to read the book or finish the book in Kelly's case. But, you know, you live in Oxford. I'm just curious with this specific book, what kind of glasses has it given you as you walk, as you live your life in Mississippi, as you travel through the space? I mean, it's one thing to write about a space and then another to actually still be living in that space. Hmm. I know what's interesting? I'm going to fumble with this. Yeah. Like, but I'm doing the most dangerous thing you can do, which is think out loud <laughs> in real time. My most conservative Trumpy family member sent me an unbelievable note about this book, which was basically like, this is a masterpiece. Mm. This is essential. What is interesting is that the University of Mississippi is becoming, for a variety of reasons, sort of like the nostalgia is its point in being. Parents from around, I was in San Francisco at a speaking engagement last week, and two different huge private equity guys came up to me and said they were sending their kids to Ole Miss because mm. they don't do that woke shit there. They, they mm. sure don't. <laughs> It is the highest percentage of -of out-of-state students in the SEC. Mostly Mm -hmm. kids from Georgia who couldn't get into Georgia and kids from Texas who couldn't get into Texas. I joke that the Ole Miss mascot should be a white Range Rover with Texas (laughs) plates. And so in places where people are from Mississippi and deal with the complexity of Mississippi, I've had nothing but positive reactions, even from incredibly conservative sort of Mm -hmm. Trumpy orders. Uh, it's made me, I haven't been to the Grove this year mm-hmm. at where the Ole Miss tailgate. Mm. And it's not cause I haven't been in town mm. and like it, it, the nostalgia of it, it is so rooted in a fake memory that I have a really hard time with it. Mm. And like, I'm hopeful that'll wear off cause I've organized my falls around going to these football games, yeah. but I, there is something that, you know, I feel like people who are actually from here, who have been here for generations, who are going to be here for generations, regardless of how they voted in the election, are game for the reconciliation of history and memory. Hmm. I find people who come here specifically for the nostalgia are deeply threatened by it. Hmm. You know, there's that Ray Wiley Hubbard song lyric that Robert Earl Kane sings about Texas, but it applies to Mississippi. It's, I may not wear a Stetson, but I'm willing to bet, son, that I'm as big a Texan as you are. Mm -hmm. And I sort of think that fellow Mississippians, even people who differ dramatically with me politically, understand my right to say it. Mm -hmm. That I've been here long enough to say whatever the fuck Mm -hmm. I want. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. so, So to answer your question, I haven't gotten any blowback. No. Other than like on Insta, like on social media, but- yeah, but fuck them. I don't really, damn, I don't really no, care. I, think I really that's... want to know how it's changed your, yeah, your sense of place. This is going to sound crazy. It makes me want to leave Oxford and move back to the mm. Delta. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Oxford is a site of memory and nostalgia, mm-hmm. and the Delta is ground zero for a messy figuring out of whatever mm. the f- looks like. And so there's a difference between the nostalgia of the old Miss thing and Mississippi being a really poor, broken place and the roots. One of the things I hope the book does is show that the roots of our brokenness are so tied both to our own original sin, but also to the fact that the worst place to be in the world is at the bottom of a commodity chain. Mm -hmm. Cotton was oil Mm -hmm. and the entire political structure of the place of Mississippi and Alabama was designed to extract 10% profit margins for banks in London, Manchester, Liverpool, and New York City, and nobody gave a shit about the damage done to get them, and nobody gave a shit once that capital could no longer get its 10% in Mississippi and moved on, and nobody gave a shit in 1933 when DuPont invented synthetics and cotton died forever and petroleum placed cotton as the world's dominant commodity. And what you have left here is the wreckage of a Mm. failed experiment and the remnants of a Mm. deeply hardwired caste system stripped from its reasons for existing, which means that the bandwidth required to untangle it is almost beyond the ability of human beings who are trying to put food on their table. Mm. And so like, it's such a huge problem 
that I don't even really know what to do about it or where to start other than the prayer of this book, which is there's got to be a tribe of us and there's got to be a way to reconcile history and memory so we can start over yeah. and try to figure out how to walk into some future together because, you know, in Mississippi, and I would argue, you know, it's the Malcolm X thing. Everything south of Canada is the south. Everything south of Canada is Mississippi. Whatever happens here is a beta test for the rest mm -hmm. of the country. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's got to be a way forward. And I can't for the life of me tell you what that is. Well, and that was your question. Yeah. And that's my super complex, no. messy answer. Well, I appreciate yeah. that answer. I, I hear you when you say it's hard to see a way forward, but I would argue that your work in a book like this is an needed step. And so, right, yeah. thank you for joining us. Thank you for writing this book. Listeners, the book is called The Barn, The Secret History of a Murder in Mississippi by the great Wright Thompson. Um, you know, you're always welcome back on the show. You don't have to be intimidated by Nikki and Anytime. Kelly. Anytime. <laughs> dude, dude, Nikki and Kelly, the first time I realized that I'm offering my fucking opinions about history. And I was like, let me see who these guys are. And I'm like, oh, oh, shit. Albert, Albert, here's the thing about relativity. There are many rooms I've been in talking about this book where I felt like I should say whatever I wanted. And then when I got your thing, I was like, do we have to do it? <laughs> no, I love this. You want to know my most arrogant hope for this yeah. little book? Like, I've gotten super competitive about all of the year-end list and the awards. Honestly, those don't drive book sales. I have an idea of what this book could mean in the memory space mm -hmm. if it could find a big enough mm -hmm. audience. Yeah. I stopped promoting Pappy Land after a month. It's yeah. selling. It's yeah. doing its thing. I'm out here grinding on this thing mm. out of arrogance, out of hubris, but also like out of a real earnest mm. belief that a book can change the world. Yeah. yeah. The Bible did. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's your bar that's right, right there. The Bible. Okay. <laughs> but for influence and sales, we'll see what you can do. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. Nicole Hemmer, thanks to you. Thanks, Jody. As always. And Kelly Carr Jackson, thanks to you. My pleasure. Radiotopia.